Thank you so much for coming, and we're excited to um, start this third annual Turning the Tide conference, which really started last night. So for those of you who were here last night and got to hear our uh, really interesting panelists, um, we're grateful to them and grateful for you all for coming. My name is Beth Shank. <clears throat> I'm one of the co-planners here at St. Pat's. I work, I'm a nurse here at the hospital and do a variety of things, and I know a lot of you, but not all of you. So what I want to do just to get us started is a few announcements. Um, to orient us to the day and what we're going to do. And then we have um, some very wonderful surprises for you today. First surprise, though, is not so wonderful. And I just need to tell you that Dr. Mylan is not able to be with us this weekend. She is taking care of ill family in Texas, and their needs were just too much for her to be able to come back. She was planning to come on Wednesday. So she sends her deepest regrets. She truly hates to miss it. And I know that you all send you her love and support, and she's with us in spirit. Because George is not here, and also because Patrick Marsalek has been a great help in planning, he is co-leading this event today. And so I want to introduce him. He will also be offering the nonviolent communication event on Monday night. And he's going to get us started this morning with um, a meaningful poem that is related to our theme. Oh, yeah. Right here. Greetings. Um, just to say a word about the poetry. Uh, Michael Mead, whom some of you may have heard about, is active in the men's movement and. Uh, other things has talked about poetry as the secular form of prayer. A poem is a way to invoke the in invisible in our lives. So I like to start with a poem, and this is a poem kind of based on the work of jo Joanna Macy and comes out of her work, which we will be doing a little bit of fun play with this afternoon. And this is called Hieroglyphic Stairway. It's 3.23 in the morning, and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something when the seasons started failing as the mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying? Did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? I'm riding home on the coma train. I've got the voice of the Milky Way in my dreams. I have teams of scientists feeding me data daily and pleading I immediately turn it into poetry. I want just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. I am the desirous Earth equidistant to the underworld and the flesh of the stars. I am everything already lost. The moment the universe turns transparent and all the light shoots through the cosmos, I use words to instigate silence. I am a hieroglyphic stairway in a buried Mayan city suddenly exposed by a hurricane. A satellite circling Earth finding dinosaur bones in the Gobi Desert. I am telescopes that see back in time. I am the precession of the equinoxes, the magnetism of the spiraling Earth. I'm riding home on the, on the Colma train with the voice of the Milky Way in my dreams. I am myths where violets blossom from blood like dying and rising gods. 
I'm the boundary of time, soul encountering soul and tongues of fire. It's 3.23 in the morning and I can't sleep because my great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the earth was unraveling? I want just this consciousness reached by people in range of secret frequencies contained in my speech. And that's by Drew Dillinger. Thank you, Patrick. And that is a little bit of the spirit with which we encounter this difficult uh, discussion. So a little bit about the day. We're going to start with really learning about the science, learning about what we know about health impacts of climate change. And then just before lunch, we'll shift just a little bit to talk about, start to think about why it's so difficult to talk about climate change in our culture. And um, I think that to bring that poem with us forward to say what are we doing and what is our obligation is maybe a helpful framing for the day. So we'll be starting now with our keynote speaker, and I'm just thrilled to have Dr. Jonathan Patz here. He's uh, been on my radar for some time, and I have communicated with him a few years ago and was really excited when we decided to focus on climate change, and he was really the first person I considered, we considered to come in. So i um, grateful that, that he could come. And he's been, I want to point all of you to this sheet, in case you haven't had it. We have all of our bios here, so rather than take time each time to go into great detail, we'd refer you to that to read for each speaker but I want to say about Dr. Patz he's been um, since he's been here he's been an awfully good sport because we've had him talking yesterday morning for our medical conference and then yesterday uh, in later in the morning for KUFM radio and then at the university with a seminar and then at MCAT with Dr. Running and then there was a, a quick opportunity to get him to talk with our senators and he went and did that and then he came last night for our spiritual panel before having dinner with his nephew so he's been packing it in here in Missoula and, and it's this kind of uh, tenacity and commitment to his work which is apparent in all of the accomplishments he's made um, his leadership on an international level and certainly a national level. And so uh, I, we're all thrilled to have him here, so please welcome Dr. Jonathan Pax. Uh, Beth, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And really, I want to thank uh, Drs. Milan and uh, Beth Shank, Dr. Beth Shank, for organizing this really amazing uh, conference and also thanks to Patrick and uh, if any of you were there last night uh, at the beginning opening for this conference uh, on how to have a discussion with people that disagree with you and really come up with constructive differing approaches rather than uh, closed-minded uh, uh, type of conversation I, I thought it was really uplifting and inspirational last night so, um, today I'm going to be talking about health effects of climate change and I'm going to focus on uh, how these problems are extremely severe and widespread and I think, you know, could be, could be our demise. On the other hand, uh, I think that if we were to grapple with climate change and really take this problem on, uh, I'm going to show you how in fact, this could be one of the greatest public health opportunities that we've had in over a century, which is why I say it could be our salvation. So um, we know that climate change is happening. Um, the, uh, you, can, you know that the North Pole is melting and, and you can see you know, the levels are you know, much more uh, rapid melting than, than normal. Um, we've lost 40% of our polar ice cap since 1979. Um, melting of ice on Greenland is uh, an upward trend. And you can see Greenland is sort of uh, disappearing. You know, when we talk about sea level rise uh, and estimates of about a half a meter sea level rise, that's only from thermo expansion of salt water warming up. If, if Greenland actually slips into the ocean, uh, add 20 feet onto that half a meter. So coming into Montana, 
uh, there are these wonderful time uh, uh, repeat photography uh, project shows you the same place in different uh, years. This is uh, the glacier, uh, Spiri Glacier in National, Glacier National Park in 1913 and then in 2008. This is Boulder Glacier uh, in the summer of 1932 and then again in 1988. So if you haven't been to Glacier National Park, you should go there as soon as possible. <laughs> So when the ice melts, of course, uh, the polar bear loses uh, th their hunting ground and the polar bear may go extinct. Um, so this is, the polar bear has become one of the poster childs for climate change. But of course, one of the, the sub-headlines here was how climate change threatens your health, which is what I've been working on for, wow, almost 20 years now. And you've seen these, these numbers. In fact, a new study just came out this week uh, that verifies this back, I think, 11,000 years, not 1,000. We're higher in temperature than we've been in the last 11,000 years. And the real concern is the rate of change. And I'm not going to talk, I'm not a climatologist. I'm a public health scientist. So. Um, you can talk to Professor Steve Running and other people uh, at the university here and, and people that know the science, but the bottom line is across a range of different scenarios of energy usage and population growth, um, we are expecting you know, very rapid rise in temperature. So what does that mean for public health? Why should we care about climate change besides species going extinct and other problems, which are big problems? Uh, well, our species could go extinct because of several of these issues. Uh, climate change has these three main physical attributes. Rising temperatures, sea level rise, as I've mentioned already, and hydrologic extremes. That means extremes of the water cycle, you know, hot air, evaporates soil moisture quickly, so you get droughts. But hot air also holds more moisture. So when it rains, it can rain really hard. So this is where the climatologists tell us to expect extremes of the water cycle. So what will these three attributes mean for health? Well, all of these you probably know about these climate sensitive health outcomes. Uh, people die in heat waves. And the urban heat island effect is, is what we do in the urban environment if we have sprawling black asphalt highways, concrete buildings, these are heat retaining surfaces. So when a heat wave strikes, the urban core area can be really hot. So that's the urban heat island effect. Um, air pollution. Uh, air pollution comes from uh, especially ground level smog ozone is very temperature sensitive. That's a secondary air pollutant. Uh, you know, the nitrogen oxides out of the tailpipe of your car plus volatile organic, organic compounds mix with sunlight and, and temperature to form ground level smog pollution. Um, also, ragweed pollen, aero allergens. I'll show you a, a, an interesting slide about ragweed, how that could increase with climate change. And locally, of course, hot temperatures and forest fires affect Missoula. That's another respiratory problem. Um, now, infectious disease, diseases, um, uh, we will be talking a little bit more about these after my session, but I'll just, I will focus on a few. Um, diseases especially carried by insects or rodents, these are vector-borne diseases, are sensitive especially to environmental conditions. And if we're thinking of extremes of the water cycle, contamination and flooding, waterborne disease issues. And we all know that our health depends on adequate food and, and water supplies, of course, could be threatened by climate change. Finally, at the bottom, we have uh, mental health and environmental refugees. And we're, we're going to also, after break, not only talk more about infectious diseases, but also mental health issues and thinking about post-traumatic stress syndrome after storms or displaced populations. Um, I think this issue of environmental refugees, while very difficult to disentangle from, from politics, like when the, the famine struck North Korea, was it the drought 
or the inflexible government? Which one was worse in causing all those fatalities? Um, very difficult to tease these apart, but I think this environmental refugees issue could be the iceberg under the tip of the iceberg. I think it could be enormous. So these are a lot of the main health effects that we're thinking about, and I'm going to go, go through a few of these. Were any of you in Europe in 2003? Besides Beth, I know you were there. Yeah, it was a, a nasty, okay, a nasty time to be there. Uh, this was a one in 500 year extreme heat wave. It killed, uh, new estimates actually are it killed more than 70,000 people in 11 days. That is a public health disaster. And you can see here as temperatures went up, you absolutely see sensitivity in the population. People die in heat waves, and this was a major disaster. Well, not so long ago, just through two and a half years ago, Russia had a similar problem. It was for one month, temperatures were over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 55,000 people were estimated to have died. Uh, lots of other problems. These severe events, like these mega heat waves in Europe and in, in, uh, in Russia, these are you know, one in 500 year events and the probability of these increasing more with climate change, according to these climatologists pub uh, publishing in the journal uh, Science, they estimate that by in the next 40 years, that's not too, too far off, 40 years, the probability of these events will increase five to tenfold. So we already know we have trouble in heat waves and if these extreme heat waves are gonna uh, not only uh, well, they're going to become more, more frequent. That's going to be a challenge to the health sector. And this is just to show, you know, what happens when the Earth's climate on average goes up a little bit. Well, it's these extreme values. You know, so a shift of one standard deviation makes a one in 40 year event turn into a one in six year event. So it's this probability of extreme events that will be increasing. Last year, more than a thousand records were broken in the United States as far as temperature. And um, this is a slide from Professor Steve Running. Um, since 1986, Western fires, your season is uh, 78 days longer. Uh, you can see these numbers, more fires. Uh, now, and that actually in Missoula, of course, means lots of smoke and particulate air pollution is hazardous. And here's a, a, another a, a graph showing in the western United States this increase in fires. Something else happened last year um, with our record heat waves. We had a record, a banner year for West Nile virus. Uh, George, I don't know if you're going to talk about this one, but um, you know, West Nile virus is carried by the Culex mosquito. Culex mosquitoes, unlike the malaria carrying mosquitoes, Anopheles mosquitoes, Culex mosquitoes, they love dirty concentrated water in the urban environment. They live in these, in the drains that are, you know, underground that, you know, the water comes in and then the pipe to, to trap the sediment and all the leaves, the pipe is a little bit higher. So you get all this nice water trapped in the bottom with leaves and debris. When you get a drought or hot weather, that water's not flushing through, and so the mosquito eggs and mosquito larvae are sitting there. So it's these hot drought conditions that ironically uh, are really good for urban dwelling uh, uh, arboviruses, viruses carried by mosquitoes, like, like uh, St. Louis encephalitis and like West Nile virus. So it's not the Centers for Disease Control and, and Prevention Vector-Borne Disease Branch um, they, say, they are saying that that heat wave across the country last year is one of the main reasons why we had a, a banner year for West Nile virus. Um, the other thing that we're noticing in this country is an increase in ragweed pollen. Uh, studies from the U.S. Department of Agriculture science, scientists uh, have looked at uh, ragweed. Uh, this is a study 
that uh, was done in Baltimore, Maryland, where the scientists planted, they had potted plants of ragweed in the, in the center of the city on top of the science center. And in the city, you know, you've got more traffic, more CO2 pollution, you know, more CO2 in the air, and it's warmer. Um, and then they, they potted these plant, ragweed plants in the suburbs and then in a rural area. Well, with that warmer temperature and <coughs> carbon dioxide in the urban core, uh, they, they had uh, pollen grain counts per cubic meter of 12,000 versus the suburban area of 3,000 versus the countryside of 2,000. So basically, ragweed pollen really responds to CO2 and temperature. And um, nationally, ragweed is, is on the rise. They've tried to control for land use disturbance, land use change, which is hard to, dis to control for. But ragweed pollen is something that is on the rise and may be exacerbated with climate change. What about temperatures around the rest of the world? This is a map that shows um, where across the, the world we will be having record-breaking summer temperatures. And on the top, everything in orange or red has a 70% probability or greater of experiencing the hottest temperatures ever recorded in their history. Oh, you know, I noticed that you've got screens over here. Here, I wonder if I should be using the other pointer. Are you guys okay with the laser? Okay, sorry. Um, anyway, maybe you can follow on the with your pointer. Yeah, whatever. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll look over here. Okay, so greater than seventy percent probability. Uh, now the the bottom map, everything in red has a ninety percent probability or greater of having the hottest temperatures ever in their history. Now what does this mean for, for food growing, for crops that in the tropics are, you know, right at the, within their temperature envelope? If you were to increase temperature a little bit, some of those crops would be stressed. And according to crop models uh, in this uh, journal uh, Science, they estimate that today's one billion people that are at risk for hunger could double in a very short period. By the middle of this century, those at risk for hunger could double because of these extreme temperatures. That's a significant threat to, to public health. But there are people that argue that global warming's greatest threat may also be the smallest because it, it may be from these diseases carried by mosquitoes. Now, how many, where are those high school students? Are there any high school students here? Oh, right over there. Okay, what is the difference between us mammals and this mosquito here? Besides the fact that you can't fly and probably most of you don't suck blood. <laughs> What's the difference between mammals and insects? There are lots of differences, but go ahead and shout out. Cold-blooded. Cold blooded. Wow, on the first first try, cold-blooded. What's your name? Piper. Piper. Okay. Do you have a gold star for Piper? <laughs> so, so um, mosquitoes are cold-blooded. Now, what that means is that you know our body temperature. We're warm-blooded. Our warm-blooded. Our body temperature is about. You know, whatever, 98.6, 30, 37 degrees centigrade, give or take. But what's the body temperature of that mosquito? It's cold blooded. Whatever the air temperature is around that mosquito, that's the body temperature of the mosquito. Now, that mosquito is harboring dangerous parasites like West Nile virus inside, or dengue fever, or malaria parasites inside the, the body of the mosquito, the warmer the air temperature, the warmer the body temperature, which means that the parasite will develop more quickly and that mosquito will become infectious more quickly. Do you believe me? Uh, we have evidence. We know malaria temperature relationships extremely well. And what we know is that uh, if we look at this graph of the extrinsic incubation period inside 
uh, of the development of the parasite inside the mosquito, what you notice is that on the y, y axis, um, this is temperature, and the x axis is the number of days it takes for that parasite to cross the stomach lining of the mosquito and develop into an, an infective stage. It's called a sporozoite stage in the salivary glands of that mosquito. So when she takes her next bite, she's actually infectious. So if you, if you think about um, this carefully, um, I, I'm going to quiz the high school students again. This is fun. OK, pretend I have uh, Plasmodium vivax. These are Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium falciparum, two different types of malaria. This one's the more dangerous type. But let's say I've got vivax in my blood. A mosquito bites me, and in this room it's 20 degrees centigrade. Um, are you, if you come back here for another presentation two weeks from now, and it's 20 degrees, will you get malaria when that mosquito bites you? 20 degrees. How long does it take for that mosquito to be infectious? I don't know, 18 days, 17, 18 days? So two weeks, that mosquito is not going to transmit disease. It's, it you know, takes longer at cooler temperatures. Now, is anyone here from down south? You know, like Hamilton? <laughs> <laughs> Brooke, where are you from? Lawrence. I'm actually from Louisville. Louisville, wow, okay. So she, she, Brooke was uh, messing with the thermostat in the room because she is kind of a wimp when it comes to Montana temperatures. And she cranked the thermostat up to 22 and a half or 23 degrees centigrade. Same situation, two weeks later, that mosquito bites you. Are you going to get malaria? Well. You know, that mosquito is now infectious at day 13 or 12 or 13 because it's a warmer temperature, right? So the mosquito becomes infectious more quickly, you'll get malaria. And even though malaria is multifactorial, it depends on drug resistance and government programs and bed nets and human population migration, temperature is very important for malaria transmission. In fact, if you look at the, the, the lines here, they, they bottom out here, they become flat. They become flat lines. That means below a certain temperature, malaria cannot develop. That's why malaria is a tropical disease. And so what we're worried about, uh, when you look at, across um, the world, if you look at a place like Zimbabwe, the country of Zimbabwe, right in the center of the country, you've got this, uh, these highlands, the highland plains. And any of you in, in Montana, you know when you climb a mountain, it gets colder. In fact, for every thousand meters that you climb, uh, it's six degrees centigrade colder. So temperature, you know, altitude's a good surrogate for temperature. Notice how, how little malaria, whoops. Notice how little malaria there is at the high altitudes. Very little malaria here. But as you drop down in elevation, you have more malaria. We can map this climate suitability for malaria. And these cool colors, these cold green and, and blue colors right in the middle in the high plateau, that indicates at the high altitude it's too cold for malaria transmission today. But 50 years from now, the climatologists are saying well, that's what the temperature is going to look like. The high, high plateau will be warm enough now for, temp for malaria transmission. So we're worried that some of these tropical diseases will spread into different areas. So are there, I know Steve running uh, is not here this morning. He was here yesterday. Um, are there any other climatologists in the room? Oh, good. I can say anything I want now. <laughs> but, but the climatologists, they say, stop calling it global warming. It's, it's also about extremes of the hydrologic cycle. More floods and more droughts. Now, in, in health, public health, why do we care about this? We care because we know today we already have trouble handling heavy rainfall and runoff. We have what are called uh, these combined sewage overflows, these C CSO events. 
Uh, and that means that you know, many places they combine storm runoff and sewage into one giant pipe. It's too expensive to separate them out. Or it's, or it's, you know, we should do that, but it's, it's very costly. So in many places around the country, if it rains too hard, you spill over the system. You have this overflow, combined sewage overflow. So today, we have enough, we have so much, so many CSOs that we have more than a trillion gallons of sewage contaminated stormwater that overflows every year, which would keep Niagara Falls running for 18 days. So we have trouble handling heavy rainfall. It's a public health risk to our, our, to our water supply. Why should we care about this with climate change? Well, guess what? Um, the sad news is, if you look at the, the right side of this graph, those are the heavy, very heavy precipitation events, and they are the ones that will increase. You know, when it rains, it will pour. That's the future. So if already we have trouble handling our runoff, storm runoff, this is what climate change will bring as far as more contamination. And we conducted a study for our region. We looked at Chicago under a, a future climate change scenario, and we may see you know, up to 100, 120% increase in the frequency of these overflow events, these combined sewage overflow events. Um, when it rains, this is the uh, city of Milwaukee. And a colleague of mine goes out in a, in a research vessel and dips the water after a heavy rain, rainfall event to look for um, contamination, sewage contamination, looking at E. coli bacteria. These flaming blue dots uh, indicate places that have extremely high counts of E. coli bacteria, including South, South Shore Beach here. So for you students, if you're in Milwaukee, don't swim at that beach after a heavy rainstorm because that would, you would get contaminated with, you'd probably uh, get sick. So when it rains, we see contamination uh, in surface waters. Now this is uh, Margaret Chen, who is the director of the World Health Organization. And the Rio Plus 20 uh, meeting, that's about sustainable environments, right? Rio plus 20, the, the Rio conference of 1992. Um, it just, you know, they had the Rio 20 years later conference. And the World Health Organization director was there talking about health and how, you know, health is more than simply the health sector. Health de depends on access to better energy sources. Health is, urban planning is public health policy. Improved sanitation, of course, sustainable food systems and health, uh, more sustainable water usage and safe working environments. Everything in yellow, of course, these are traditionally environmental issues, right? Access to energy and urban planning, but now we know today these really are front and center also public health policy issues. And there was a report that the World Health Organization put out that is perfectly in parallel with the theme of this conference, uh, our planet, our health, our future, uh, human health, and the Rio Convention. And the Rio Convention deals with biological diversity, climate change, and desertification. Traditionally, environmental issues, these are absolutely health issues. Now, I want to shift gears and um, mention something else about um, climate change and health, and that is, is that over time, different populations will be affected disproportionately. Um, and and it, it involves, um, you know, if you think, if, if any of you attended last night's session, um, you know, there, there, these were some, some of our main uh, religious leaders that were presenting and, and just brilliant uh, information. And I love the Native American perspective. Uh, you know, they get it right already. They, they plan for seven generations. In any decision, you have to think seven generations down the road uh, and that you can't separate humans from nature, you know. And the famous Wisconsin uh, naturalist, um, Alda Leopold, said, when you see a sick patient, look to the land. 
because we are so connected. And if, and if we're disturbing nature and disturbing Mother Earth, we are hurting ourselves. Anyway, there are some big ethical challenges here. And this is not a cartoon. This is actually called a cartogram. These are data-driven maps. And what you see on the bottom is World Health Organization data for climate-sensitive diseases, big climate-sensitive diseases like malaria, malnutrition, and diarrheal disease, which we know are very linked to climate. And on the bottom you see places like Africa and India, you know, poor countries where you've got lots of these diseases, and what is the increase in the last 30 years of greenhouse gas pollution that have raised the Earth's average temperature by one degree Fahrenheit? Putting into malaria and malnutrition models and diarrheal disease models, this is where we first see big increases in disease from climate change. Now who's causing climate change? You know, what is climate change? Climate change is mostly from burning fossil fuels by industrialized countries. And if you look at the top map, look at Africa just shriveling up. Um, this top map is greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. So this is actually CO2 emissions, the most abundant greenhouse gas. And the United States is the number one responsible country if we're looking at just, this is a 50-year aggregate of greenhouse gas pollution. This year, well actually a couple of years ago, China became the number one emitter of greenhouse gas pollution. So China has now overtaken us with, with all that pollution, although of course, well never mind. Some of the American market is driving that, but China has, has overtaken us. But this is looking at Who's responsible for global warming today? And this is looking at 50 years of pollution. And the United States is the number one most responsible. Germany's up there, and so is China. But when you look at this map and you think about um, those that are most vulnerable also being the least responsible for the problem, is that an ethical crisis? I think it is. And you think uh, about a, the average American, we consume energy uh, six times greater than the average global citizen. So some people argue that our energy consumption and our energy behavior is actually killing people around the world. I took this um, argument to, I, had a, I was very lucky, I was able to present this to uh, the Dalai Lama. Uh, last, uh, well, fall, a year and a half ago. And, you know, I was explaining, you know, when we started burning coal and we had steam engines and industry, this is a great thing and it was great news. You know, real development and economic development. But then in, do you guys know what happened in 1952 in London? Have you ever heard of the killer London smog episode? We're all, you know, burning all the coal and the smokestacks in London. Uh, they had this air inversion and all that particulate and pollution killed thousands of people. That was when we realized, oh gosh, if we burn coal and oil and all this, put all this smoke into the atmosphere and use our atmosphere like a toilet, just, uh, if we put all that smoke in there, it actually kills people and it's dangerous. Oh yes, air pollution is hazardous. Okay, we learned that in 1950, 1952. Then we put scrubbers on smokestacks, we moved industry out of the cities, um, and so we sort of solved that problem a little bit, but not, all, not yet all over the world. Um, but we still emit greenhouse gases. You know, you can have clean emissions out of a smokestack, but still put up a lot of CO2 that disturbs the climate. So the Dalai Lama said to me, if you guys know all this, this is exactly his quote, he said, if you know pollution kills, your country is not showing much compassion, correct? <laughs> and last night uh, we had some Buddhist perspectives uh, that were presented uh, and how we're all interconnected and the idea that you know we need to be compassionate. Well, if we just continue to have our energy behavior and, and business as usual with what we're doing with fossil fuels, it's not ethical. It's, we're, we're, you know, we know that it's dangerous. We know that we're hurting people around the world. It's a simple, brilliant question that he asks. 
So here's the, here's the good news. You know, could the health benefits make combating climate change free or even a net gain? You know, if we think about, oh gosh, we've got to sacrifice and we've got to stop burning fossil fuel, I feel so guilty, we've got to clean it up. Wait a second. If we clean up our act and stop burning fossil fuels, we could actually benefit from this. These are some obvious statistics that you know. This is from the World Health Organization. The top number, 900,000 deaths occur prematurely because of conventional air pollution. You know, we still have dirty cities. And even in the United States, more than 60,000 people die prematurely from particulate air pollution. Um, so, you know, when you burn fossil fuels, that creates greenhouse gas pollution and, and warms the, the planet, but also you get all your other nasty things when you burn fossil fuel, like particulate air pollution, sulfur dioxide, lead in some countries, it's still have leaded gasoline, all that stuff. So, you know, reducing fossil fuels to, to prevent climate change, also you get this benefit of cleaning up the urban air and you might save a lot of lives. The second bullet down here, uh, the World Health Organization estimates almost two million deaths occur because of physical inactivity. And in our country, we have an automobile dependent society. And so the World Health Organization says the growing trend in lack of physical fitness is a big, a big problem. So what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Do you guys see a problem with this picture? <laughs> now, I would argue that um, when you look at this, we've actually designed our cities. I know the mayor is going to be here this afternoon, which is great. Um, we've designed cities that sort of look like this. If you think about this design, um, those are not sidewalks, actually. Sidewalks are expensive to put into development. Uh, that's not a sidewalk. This is, um, the curviness is, so you don't have stop signs, so you don't have to worry about pedestrians or anything like that. These types of designs are made for the automobile. And, um, and there are also fences. Uh, I don't know if you can see the fences there. You know, this is not conducive of walking or even biking. Well, you know, if you want to get anywhere besides, if you want to get to a store or a school, you know, it's, you, don't, you don't see one. You have a question? At that fitness center, if you had shown the parking lot, it would have been full of cars and not bikes. That's true. That's true. <laughs> fitness center would have been, a parking lot would have been filled with cars and not bikes. Now, mind you, um, not everybody can, people that live in these types of locations, if you interview them, there, there's some studies that show that a lot of the people that live in suburban areas like this actually would prefer to live in the city but they can't afford it. So there are all sorts of things, you know, this is not, I, I grew up in a sub, suburban area myself, and uh, so I don't want to make anyone feel guilty about living in a place like that, but this is, this is unhealthy design. And all of you have seen these maps, you know, the rates of uh, obesity in this country uh, are just amazing uh, over time. Now, when I look at these, this to me says, you know, people that are overweight, it's not their fault. I think it's a system-wide failure in the United States. Number one, of course, the unethical food, uh, marketing of uh, uh, unhealthy food in, in schools, that's a problem. Um, so food in it is an issue, but I think the way we've designed our cities, people that would like to bicycle to work or walk to a bus and have decent mass transit, we don't have it in this country. You go to Europe and you look at trends, you know, 30 to 50% of people are walking or biking to work in Europe. And in Holland, it's, it's greater than 50%. You know, I think we've got a system-wide problem here. In fact, the CDC re uh, says that uh, overweight and obesity is the number one epidemic in our country. Question? The other thing is in Europe, they don't allow genetically modified foods either, which is a cost for the obesity. 
just one. Okay, that's another issue. That's there's some. That's a. That's a deep issue. <laughs> but uh, we. Um, so. This is where we are today. We are 17 pounds heavier than we were 30 years ago. Children are overweight, 15%. Uh, diabetes is on the rise. But I actually have seen um, good news on this front. Now that there's no, you know, they're banning soft drinks in schools and there are all sorts of different programs and uh, requiring phys ed and everything, that um, we actually may be turning this around. I've seen levels leveling off and maybe coming down a little bit in childhood obesity. This is great news. But here's what I want to focus on. This yellow down here. 60% of Americans don't meet minimum levels of exercise. Now, if you live in Missoula, Montana, or Madison, Wisconsin, which is a gold-ranked bikeable city, you know, they're more, you know, this is not the issue. I know you guys are all healthy out here in Missoula and you're all hiking and skiing and everything else, but this is average American, 60% of Americans don't get enough exercise. And so many of our car trips, 40% of car trips are less than two miles. Very short car trips. So what if we were to achieve some of these short car trips by active transportation, walking or biking or walking to mass transit instead of driving a car? And you think when you look at the leading causes of death in our country, heart disease, cancer, strokes, lung disease, unintentional injury and diabetes, all of those are related to just a few things. One is food and diet, but the others are air pollution, motor vehicle crashes, and physical inactivity. So I think that there's a great opportunity if we were to change our transportation a little bit. We actually conducted a study in the Midwest, and we asked the question, um, assume, let's assume that all short car trips that are only two and a half miles or five miles round trip or less could be accomplished through non-internal combustion engine modes of transport. Now, we are only looking at the metropolitan area, not the rural locations that have more distances, but just in the cities. What would happen if we could eliminate short car trips? What would happen to our air quality? Now, uh, this is our region, the Great Lakes region, um, and these are the 11 big cities that we were looking at. So eliminate short car trips, what would happen? Well, we know from the National Transportation Survey, we know where all the cars are, we know driving behavior, and we can actually map emissions from the tailpipe. So we have a map of emissions from the tailpipe here, and what we um, can do then is say, Okay, what, what do these pollutants do for air pollution in the region? We, we will link this to a regional air, air pollution map. And what we're modeling is the difference in air pollution from normal you know, business as usual versus the short car trips are off the road. Also, short car trips are the most polluting. Do you guys know what, what a catalytic converter is? It's at the, you know, at the exhaust of your car. It helps clean the exhaust so you don't put out so many nasty things out of the tailpipe of a car. Catalytic converters take some time to warm up and operate and work. So these, when the engine is cold and you take a quick short car trip, you're polluting more. So that's another advantage of getting rid of short car trips. So what we then do is we say that change in pollution superimposed over the population in that area and looking at rates of different diseases, um, what does that change in pollution do to health outcomes? The second question in this study is, okay, so we've got, we're looking at air pollution. Now the second one is, what if half of those short car trips are achieved by, accomplished by bicycle? So just half of the car trips, not all of them, but half of the car trips are done by bicycle. And because we're in the you know, Great Lakes region, not everybody bicycles in the wintertime, let's be conservative and just say, okay, the exercise from four months, the summer months, four months of biking per year 
half of the car trips, these short car trips, what is that physical fitness benefit? So the, um, here's the air pollution results from the short car trips off the road, which is about 20% of vehicle miles traveled. We would save more than 500 lives, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations, and $4 billion per year in avoided mortality and health costs. So the change in air pollution actually is not a big change, but that's, it's a small change in particulate air pollution. Over 11 large cities were saving 500 lives per year and $4 billion savings in uh, mortality and health costs. That's a lot of money and a lot of lives and a lot of hospitalizations um, that we're talking about. Now, remember the second one. Now, let's add physical activity onto this. If we add those, you know, half of the bike trips, half of those trips by bike only in the summertime, we'd save another 700 lives. So we're talking about $8 billion, uh, about 12, about 11, uh, 11 and a half hundred lives saved every year from this small change. So, of course, um, some implications, swapping tailpipes for pedals, small changes could pay huge dividends for public health and the economy. These have been rep uh, repeated uh, in other places. In London, for example, looking at bicycle transportation, um, you could save, uh, you know, reduce heart attacks by 19%, strokes, dementia, breast cancer, road traffic crashes. You see huge deaths avoided, huge, huge numbers of deaths avoided. So, you know, this is a great thing. Now, you might ask, wait a second, isn't it dangerous to ride a bike? Right? You might get killed riding a bike. Well, the study showed that in, in Holland, where they really have great bicycle infrastructure, the, the benefit to risk ratio of that benefit of exercising versus the risk of being hit by a car or breathing more, higher ventilation rate, breathing pollution more when you're exercising, the benefit risk ratio was nine to one. Nine benefit versus one risk. In London, it's about seven to one. And in the United States, it all depends on what kind of city you have. Now I notice you have lots of bike lanes here and the biking infrastructure is getting better in Missoula. So I, I hope it's getting safer here. But it all depends on if you live in a platinum ranked bikeable city like Portland, Oregon versus other places, Dallas, Texas or other places that are, that, where it would be dangerous to ride a bike. So, but the, the point here is that there's a huge public health benefit to be gained if we design cities that make it safe for biking. And that's uh, more pressure on urban planners and mayors to make sure that their cities are designed for that. Now, um, I was lucky enough, uh, thanks to Molly, to meet with a couple of senators last night. And one thing that is really important for you to, in your public dialogue and when you talk to, especially to decision makers or politicians, to understand that when we're talking about energy options and they say, well, oil and coal are cheap, which, you know, they're subsidized, so they're not that cheap, but they're, you know, right now compared to solar and others, let's, for the sake of argument, say that they're cheap. And that to take, to clean up our act, to take, to remove one ton of CO2, at the bottom here, one ton of CO2 to, to have cleaner energy and remove a ton of CO2, it could cost up to $30 per ton. That is the only thing that we are arguing in, in Congress, in state legislature. We are only focused on this bottom $30. You know, it's going to cost too much to change. Now, I just told you about our study where you'd save $8 billion every year if we had cleaner transportation. And according to this study done by an energy policy expert, Greg Nemet, um, he looked uh, at studies around the, around the world and the top number here, 49, see that number up there, 49? 
Uh, here's a, I'm going to ask you a really tough question. Which number is bigger? <laughs> 49 or 30? Uh, 49. <laughs> right. 49 is bigger. Okay. So the, the policymakers are only talking about the bottom number. It's going to cost $30 per ton to have cleaner energy. Oh my gosh, we can't afford that. But if you have cleaner energy, guess what? You're going to save $49 per ton for health savings. And this is what has to get into the political debate. And everyone in this room, I want you to remember that 49 is bigger than 30. Okay? So, you know, a low carbon economy can make us healthier and can save money. That's a picture from London. And, you know, I know this is uh, near and dear to uh, you guys. Montana coal and route to China, this is a big deal now. So when you see these pictures and, and you start talking about this, make sure you demand your decision makers to think about the other part of the equation, that burning coal kills people, it's dangerous, and it costs the economy. So what can you do? Number one, ask political leaders to include the health benefits side of the equation when debating energy. They're not doing that, and they should. And if they knew the numbers, they'd say, oh, we're only discussing less than half of the issue. Demand more sustainable communities with multimodal transportation. Uh, Missoula is on its way to doing a great job and having opportunities for people that want to get around by active transport. And I don't mean just bicycling, because not everyone can ride a bike, or not everyone can, need, you know, can ride a bike and carry groceries and babies at the same time, but to have options. And if you, on average, if you have good public transportation, that walk to the bus and then to your school or office gives you 20 minutes of good exercise. Um, food, you know, on average, the food that comes to your plate has traveled 1,200 miles. Uh, so buying locally grown. Now, of course, it depends how sustainable that local grower is. And I know that um, your new senator here is an organic farmer, John uh, Tester. Um, so that would probably be good to buy his farm, farm food stuff. And, um, you know, there are all sorts of, and last night, uh, there was the, um, not only Native American, but the Buddhist perspective. Everything is interconnected, you know. And so when we eat meat, you know, protein to produce protein from red meat is very energy and water consumptive. So this is another, another thing that you can do as far as energy. So finally, I want to just wrap up and say, you know, I, climate change is real. Um, the science is in, there's not, the only debate, the only country where we debate climate change science is the United States. You go around the world, I've been to places where they have vice provosts for climate change research. You know, the United States is the only place where we still debate the science of climate change, unfortunately. But let's pretend for a second that climate change, let's forget about climate change. Let's say climate change doesn't happen. And the health risks that I'm worried about, you know, let's forget about those. Let's forget about climate change. What if we were to go with cleaner energy and green transportation and you know, do all this stuff? What if it's a big hoax, climate change is a big hoax, and we create a better world for nothing? We have healthier cities, cleaner air, a more fit population. We do that, but climate change doesn't happen. You know, <laughs> to me, even for the deniers of climate change, it's crazy to not try to try to clean up our act. You know, live more sustainably because if we do that, we have only great things to gain. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
Um, Beth, do we have time for questions or should we take a break? We can have a few questions and we would ask if you do have some to please come to a mic or at least Dr. Pats to repeat it so we can capture it on our television. Okay, you need to go to the mic, young man. Um, um, if we lower uh, amount of coal use, what about the jobs for the coal miners? Oh, that's How will that affect them? Great question. That's a great question. So, you know, there are always there are always trade-offs, and you know the question is, you know, we get away from coal, and there are jobs that are going to be lost. Um, how many people? How many miners do you think work in in down underground in mines these days? There, you know, there there are a number, but a lot of them, a lot of it is mechanized. But that's a fair question, you know. Um, I'm not an economist, but what I'll tell you is that, you know, there are jobs in, in green energy, too. How many people could you employ building wind, uh, wind farms, wind and solar farms? And so I think what we need to do is, is to, we need to be, um, we need to come into the 21st century and recognize that if we keep our old forms of energy and we, you know, that's our job infrastructure, we're going to be completely um, outmaneuvered by China and other countries that are going full force in sustainable energy and jobs programs in sustainable energy. So there are lots of jobs in other energy sectors and we, you know, maybe we can have some job retraining for miners, something like that. But there are always trade-offs. There's never a, you know, this is the right way and that's the wrong way and everyone is going to benefit. You know, we're going to have to change uh, and, and think about there are other job opportunities and the people that lose jobs, maybe they can be retrained for other opportunities. But that's a great, very important question. Thank you. Not to mention the mortality rate of people working. Yes, that's true. But coal mining is pretty dangerous. And so maybe uh, you'd have an added benefit there to not be mining. Yeah. I was going to make a quick comment and then ask a question. Um, certainly there have been many economic studies that concluded that the same amount of money invested in green energy produced many, many more jobs than the same amount of money invested in coal mining or something of that sort. So it's Thank actually you. just just like the sort of trade-offs you've been showing where we're only talking about part of the job picture. If we would invest that money instead in green energy, we'd generate many more jobs than we're generating through fossil fuel related jobs. But I wanted to go back to one of your earlier slides that uh, uh, had a, a developing countries and already developed countries and the amount of benefits, the health benefits, uh, there were dots for the different countries and some of the countries had a great big set of error bars on them and others were just a single dot and, and I wondered why that was, why some showed a big range and some just had a single dot. Yes, so, so my colleague uh, Greg Nemeth, the energy policy expert, um, he, he looked at all studies that have looked at cost and benefit of reducing CO2, sequestering CO2. Um, and, um, and there's huge variability. So that's, that's all, I don't know why, but there, there, you know, it's a, there's a lot of variability in those numbers. Oh, okay, so in some cases he had only one estimate, is, and, he, and in other cases there were multiple estimates. That's why some were a single dot, and yeah. some showed a big yeah. range. I'll have to them. send you that study. I'll get you in contact with Dr. Nemeth. Sorry. Likewise, I have more of a, more of a comment than a question. Uh, appreciate your uh, references to Missoula's good bikeability. And as, as Madison, Missoula did reach the gold level uh, status for bikeability uh, this past year. Wow. And would like to encourage uh, all of the attendees here to uh, become more uh, cognizant of the benefits of biking in Missoula and the safety of Missoula. I'm an example of safe biking in Missoula. Been a commuter for 40 years and no accidents at this point, so. All right, thank you. How about let's take one over over here. This is just a, also, is this on? Uh, just a uh, 
comment of appreciation that you brought up the ethical angle. My name is Dan Spencer, and I teach environmental studies and ethics at the University of Montana. And the issue of environmental justice, I think, is just so critical um, that those who are the least involved in causing the problem pay the biggest burden is so dramatic. I just uh, spent uh, most of January with the University of Montana class in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam and looking at the impact of climate change on there was particularly sea level rise. And it's so striking. Um, one of the things that's so refreshing, as you mentioned, there's no debate there about whether or not climate change is real because they're already living with the effects in there and, and it's really dramatic and the problems. But what I found so encouraging about your program is to show that even if we're not moved by the ethical issues, which I think we should be, um, that this is still a win-win scenario, that if we actually pay attention to these things, that all of us will benefit, and so we can address the ethical concerns to particularly the more poor and most vulnerable people who are being most impacted by climate change, but that we all end up being better off. And the second thing is we can do so much of that by simply paying attention to the way we design our cities and our, our livelihoods, so it doesn't have to be an imposed burden. We can actually make much, much more livable places to live and also have better health and address these issues. So I really thank you for the way you framed the issues on that. Oh, thank you. And, and I, I mean, I, I uh, bicycle to work myself for selfish reasons because it's faster and it's, 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 it's better, you know, so we benefit. But no, that's, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I really liked where you um, brought up the added costs that aren't considered in, you know, that, that $30 per ton. Um, and that's just the health costs. Um, I work with climate change more in an environmental aspect, but we don't usually include the cost of damage to our water supplies, our fisheries, our forests. Um, if you look at the farmers right now, um, with the drought, I mean, they're closing slaughterhouses and all sorts of things all over with massive losses of jobs. So, you know, when we talk about a few jobs lost here and there because of energy, the thousands and thousands of jobs we're losing already with farms and, and other things are huge. So it's nice to see people pulling together those added costs because those aren't included usually. People don't get that story. So thanks. Right, thank you. Yeah, we, we have to get, you know, we talk about the market and, and a free market, but a market's not free unless we have all of these, they're called externalities, all these things that aren't in the equation. We have to get them in and, and, and do a full life cycle analysis of what, you know, the actions we do. We need to know the, the side effects and implications and, and, and value those. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I want to speak for the mosquito. <laughs> uh, since everything is interconnected and everything has value in and of itself, what is the purpose of the mosquito? Is it to keep the human population down? <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some people, yes, uh, would argue, uh, in fact, that when we, we go in and we disturb nature, we go into a jungle and there's bushmeat hunting, <clears throat> you know, that those microbes and viruses, like HIV AIDS came from chimpanzees. You know, this is a, <clears throat> a check on the human population maybe. And you know, people say, you know, we're, we're going to destroy the earth. Of course we're not. We're going to, the earth, you know, thousands of years from now, you said this last night, I think, you know, the earth will take care of itself eventually. We, we just won't be on it. Um, yeah. A question over here. I want to concur with what everybody else has been saying that looking at the health benefits over talking about just climate change is really profound and not something that's talked about a lot. Um, my question is, is, you know, most of your talk is based upon projection. Projection into the future, the possibility that if we continue down this road, this is the possible outcome. And so, of course, with that conjecture, we also can sit back and say, okay, so it hasn't happened yet. What do you feel needs to be done today, and how long do we need to do those changes to stop the projection from happening? Yeah, so, so that's a very good, tough question about, you know, the, the perception that climate change is in the future. Uh, that's a problem and that will cause inaction. We won't do anything. 
Uh, there are two issues. One is, uh, yes, it's already happening. The Earth has warmed, and you can see, you know, the, the ice caps are melting. Um, you can see other, you know, you've got the pine bark beetle, and you've got changes in vegetation. There, there's all sorts of biological and physical evidence that yes, the Earth has warmed up, is warming. The question about public health, though, is, you know, when you have should the Chicago heat wave that kills 700 people, the European heat wave that kills 70,000 people, the, you know, all these different disasters, Hurricane Sandy, which was bigger than normal, uh, the Atlantic Ocean was warmer than average, and sea surface temperatures do drive the strength of hurricanes. You cannot say, though, what climatologists warn us to say, you know, any one or two or three or four or five of those events, you can't say, that's global warming that proves it. That's a problem. And, um, but what you can say is that the probability is increasing. Um, you know, the, the analogy that the, the NOAA has already used is the climate on steroids. You know, a baseball player hits a home run. Did the steroids cause that home run? No, not sure. You can't say, right? But did the steroids increase the probability of that being hit? So the challenge, though, is really to say, you know, these things are affecting us today. The, West, the, the record West Nile virus epidemic across the United States last year, the CDC attributes the record heat wave to that being a problem. Was it climate change? Well, you can't pin any one thing. So I think this is the challenge in how we communicate this, this issue. It is happening today, but it's going to keep getting worse. And I don't really know. I, there, are, there are experts in climate change communication, too, that I think we need to get on board just to help us figure out uh, this, this, this challenge. I, I, maybe I made a mistake in how I said it. I, I know that it's happening. Right. And it's, when I said that yours were projections, it's not that I, I know it's happening. Yeah. What do we need to do today to stop the projection from coming true? Ah. Ah, well, that's, and that's, how long do we need to sustain that change if we actually did it today sure, sure. to stop that okay. projection? I'll just, I'll just tell you what the climatologists tell me, because I'm not a climatologist. You know, the greenhouse gases, you know, the pollution that we put in the atmosphere today lasts for 50 to 100 years. So there's inertia in the climate system. We will inevitably warm up a little bit because we've already, we're committed because that's 50 year the stuff we put up there is going to last at least 50 years. Um, what the climatologists tell us is if we want to avoid going beyond two degrees centigrade average warming and then after that all hell breaks loose with ecosystems and all sorts of things, that um, we pretty much need to shut down fossil fuel within the next five to ten years. If we don't do that, trouble. So it's extremely urgent, uh, extremely challenging, um, and we all need to uh, work on that. Uh, Beth? Let, let me just say, um, just so that we can keep moving, I would. I want to hear all your questions, and I'm just wondering, we want to take those questions. However, we're going to have more opportunity for questions with our full panel. So we just ask the three of you to consider if you want to wait to ask the full panel or ask Dr. Patz now, and then let's end it after these three so we can move to the next. You'll wait, okay. Uh, an excellent resource for you and I and everybody is the transition movement which has gone viral and it's all over the world and we have it now transition Missoula here and there's a table out in the uh, aisle and we have lots of materials for what you and I can do today. Great, thank you. Um, it seems to me like um, an important part of this discussion, which maybe we haven't gotten into this morning, is the increase in our global population. I feel like that's what's driving sure. so much of this. Yeah, so if you think about you know, the root causes of the problem, there, there are two root causes. One is human population growth, and then the other is per person, per capita, energy consumption and natural resource consumption. Um, so it's true that as the po human population grows, that puts more strain on environmental resources. But we're actually having much better success through family planning 
um, programs around the world in reducing the rate of rise of our population. We're still rising, but the estimates from the United Nations uh, and others are that our population growth may stabilize at about 10 billion. And or maybe at the most 11 billion, but but this issue of population growth, it's important. But I would argue, we're having better success in reducing the rate of population growth, even though we're not the problem isn't solved. But we have a much better right now success in reducing the, the rate of population compared to our rate of con energy consumption. And in fact, um, I do have to say there is still sad news, which is. Um, even with all the science of climate change and the looking at the estimates for energy consumption, we're really consuming more than worst case scenario. We keep just blasting through without changing our energy, energy consumption. So population is definitely a problem, but I think we have more success right now in dealing with population than we are in our energy and resource consumption. So that's where I think more attention needs to be had. But thanks for raising that. So, I, Beth, I guess we should take a break, right? You want to say something? Yeah, first, thanks, Dr. Patz. Fantastic. And, and yes, we have really three other great people who are going to gonna share more in depth on, on these subjects that you can read about in your, your program, but from infectious disease, mental health, and community health aspects.